Lowell VA Security, local law enforcement, and the Pennsylvania State Police right here in Butler. We're proud to announce the presence of Gold Star family members that are visiting the wall today. Please thank them for the presence and honor them for the sacrifice they've endured. The family of William Winters, the family of William Lesnick, the family of Merle Brown, the cousin of Gary George, the niece of uh, Thomas Sizowitz, the cousin of Willem Lessig, and the family of Thomas Russell Kisner, and the family of Glenn Robert Wiley. Also the family of Charles Shaw, the family of William Anderson, and the family and friends of Edward Heasley, along with the family of Douglas Andre, and the sister of James Steitner. My name is Rex Brown. I'm a member of the Cranberry Township Veterans of Foreign Wars, Post Evans 879. I'm a veteran of both the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force from the Vietnam era through the current world conflicts. It's my great honor to serve you as Master of Ceremonies. We welcome all of you. The AVTT Traveling Wall is a mission of honor, respect, remembrance of our fallen and serving serving men and women in uniform for those without the means to travel to our great national memorial. Give it the respect that it has earned and remember that this entire area is a non-smoking area. At this time I'm... At this time... Uh, somebody, he's outside. The power's on. Where is it? I don't know, but the power's on. It's the orange. Somebody unplugged the power. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's good. Is it full of a it's fine. I wanted to turn myself again. Yeah. Is it you or I think it's Is it switch order? Yeah. Turn it off. 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 Oh, wait, it's not that one. Yeah, I'm right here, Joe. Is there a power? No. Take the filter off.
I'm assuming that you're going to have me back for that for today. That's just an assumption. We have not been looking for it. So you're going to put in your uh, good word for y'all, right? This one? talk to you tonight about some facts about the wall. A Vietnam veteran came up with the idea of the memorial. Jan Shrugs was an infantry corporal who wanted to place, uh, place to commemorate all those who served and sacrificed their lives in Vietnam. The wall is designed by a college student. Her name, Maya Yen Ling, and she was an undergrad at, uh, at the Yale at the time. There were more than 1,400 entries submitted to a national design competition, and a panel of eight anonymous judges chose Lynn's design. It took less than eight months to build the memorial. The groundbreaking took place on March 26, 1982, and the wall uh, walls ground and was completed in late October and dedicated November 13, 1982. The wall is made of black granite from Bangalore, India. The country is one of only three in the world, Sweden and South Africa are the other two, where you can get such a large amount of black granite. No federal funds were needed to create this memorial. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund raised nearly $9 million through private contributions and corporations, foundations, unions, veterans, and civic organizations. More than 275,000 individual Americans also con contributed. There are currently 58,479 names listed on the wall. The names are listed chronologically by date of casualty. More than half of the people listed on the wall are under 22. The largest age group is made up of 19 year olds. The names of eight women appear on the wall and they nursed the wounded. The number killed on their first day in Vietnam was 997. By comparison, 1,448 soldiers were killed on their last day in Vietnam. The state with the highest casualty rate per capita belongs to West Virginia. The names of 711 West Virginians appear on the wall. Okay. The day with the most casualties was January 31st. 1968. There were 245 lives lost that day. This was the first day of the Tet Offensive. The memorial wall is made up of two 246 feet 9 inch long Gavro walls etched with the names of servicemen being honored. The walls are sunken into the ground with earth behind them. At the highest tip of the apex where they meet they are 10 feet 1 inch high and tapered to a height of 8 inches at their extremities. Symbolically, this is described as a wound that is closed and healing. When a visitor looks up at the wall, his or her reflection can be seen simultaneously with the engraved names, which is meant to symbolically bring the past 
and the President together. One wall points toward the Washington Monument, the other in the direction of the Lincoln Memorial, meeting at an angle of 125 degrees, 12 feet. Each wall has 72 panels, 70 listing names, numbered 1 East through 70 East, and 70 West through 1 West, and two very small blank panels at the extremities. There is a pathway along the base of the wall where visitors may walk. The wall originally listed 58,191 names when it was completed in 1983. As of May 2017, there are now 58,318 names, including eight women. Approximately 1,200 of these are listed as missing in action, prisoners of war, and others. At this time, the invocation will be given by Navy veteran Jim Pochard, Chaplain, Cranberry Township, Veterans of War Post 879. Uncover. Bow your heads. Your son was a prisoner. Condemned, he died for us. Victorious. He returned to bring us the gift of life, everlasting. Comfort us now in our longing for the return of the prisoners of war and those missing in action. Help us, Father. Inspire us to remove the obstacles. Give courage to those who know the truth to speak out. Grant wisdom to the negotiators and compassion to the jailers. Inspire the media to speak out loudly as they have in the past. Protect those who seek in secret and help them succeed. Show us the tools to you your will. Guard and bless those in captivity, their families and those who work for their release. Let them come home soon. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Let us now honor our flag and our country with the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please stay risen. I have to sing the Star Spangled Banner. I'm very pleased to present Anna Bossinger. Anna. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight were the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled Thank you for honoring our country with your great voice. 
Please be seated. For more than 200 years, the American flag has been the symbol of our nation's unity, as well as a source of pride and inspiration for millions of citizens. Born on June 14, 1777, the Second Continental Congress determined that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes, alternating between seven red and six white, and that the Union be 13 stars, while in a blue field representing a new uh, constellation. Between 1777 and 1960, the shape and design of the flag evolved into the flag presented before you today. The 13 horizontal stripes represent the original 13 colonies, while the stars represent the 50 states of the Union. The colors of the flag are symbolic as well. Red symbolizes hardiness and valor. White signifies purity and innocence, and blue represents vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Traditionally, a symbol of liberty, the American flag has carried the message of freedom and inspired Americans both at home and abroad. In 1814, Francis Scott Key was so moved at seeing the stars and stripes waving after the British shelling of Baltimore's Fort McHenry that he wrote the words to the Star Spangled Banner. In 1892, the flag inspired Francis Bellamy to write the Pledge of Allegiance, our most famous flag salute and patriotic oath. In July 1969, the American flag was flown in space when Neil Armstrong planted it on the surface of the moon. Today, our flag flies on military vehicles and satellites that circle our globe. Indeed, it flies in the hearts of every soldier, sailor, and airman, and marine. Since 1776, since 1776, no generation of Americans has been spared the responsibility of defending freedom. Today, those who serve remain committed to preserving the freedom that others won for generations to come. By displaying the flag and giving it a distinctive fold, we show respect to the flag and express our gratitude to those individuals who fought and can continue to fight for freedom at home and abroad. Since the dawn of the 20th century, Soldiers, sailor, sailors, airmen, and marines have proudly flown the flag in every major conflict on the land and skies around the world. It's their responsibility, our responsibility, to continue to protect and preserve the rights, privileges, and freedoms that we as Americans enjoy today. The United States flag represents who we are. It stands for the freedom we all share and the pride and patriotism we feel for our country. We cherish its legacy and as a beacon of hope to one and all, long may it wave. At this, t at this time, we're going to introduce you to the flag folding ceremony. Our narrator today is Rachel Harrington, veteran and currently serving with the US, Army, or US Air Force uh, and also Assisting her will be Navy veteran Eric Gordon, who's currently a reservist, and Eric Gordon from the 9-11th Honor Guard, Correction Honor Guard, a member Sean, uh, Sean Frederick, and Army veteran Paul Hughes. The flag folding ceremony represents the same religious principles on which our country was originally founded. The portion of the flag denoting honor is a canton of our country of blue stars representing the states of our veterans served in uniform. The canton of blue field of dresses from left to right and inverted when draped as a pall on a casket of a veteran who served our country in uniform. In the armed forces of the United States at the ceremony of retreat, the flag is lowered, folded in a triangle fold, and kept under watch throughout the night as a tribute to our nation's honored dead. The next morning, it is brought out, and at the ceremony of Reveille, run aloft as a symbol of our belief in the resurrection of the body.
The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in eternal life. The third fold is made in honor and rem remembrance of the veterans departing our ranks who gave a portion of their life for the defense of our country to attain a peace throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nature. For as American citizens trusting in God, it is him we turn in times of peace as well as times of war for his divine guidance. The fifth fold is a tribute to our country. For in the words of Stephen Decor, our country, and dealing with other countries, may she always be right, but in still she is our country, right or wrong. The sixth fold is where our hearts lie. It is in our hearts that we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The seventh fold is a tribute to our armed forces, for it is through the armed forces that we protect our country and our flag against all her enemies, whether they be within or without the boundaries of our republic. The eighth fold is a tribute to the one who entered in the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day and honor to the mother for whom it flies on Mother's Day. The ninth fold is a tribute to womanhood, for it has been through their eyes, love, faith, loyalty, and devotion that the character of the men and women who have made this country great have been molded. The tenth fold is a tribute to the father, for he too has given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country since the day they were born. The eleventh fold in the eyes of a Hebrew citizen, represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon and glorifies in their eyes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold in the eyes of a Christian citizen represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies in their eyes God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. When the flag is completely folded, the stars are uppermost, reminding us of our nation, national motto, in God we trust. After the flag is completely folded and tucked in, it takes on the appearance of a cocked hat, ever reminding us of the soldiers who served under General George Washington and the sailors and Marines who served under Captain John Paul Jones, who were followed by their comrades and shipmates and the armed forces of the United States, preserving for us the rights and privileges and the freedoms we enjoy today. In 1971, Mrs. Michael Hoff, the wife of a U.S. military officer listed as missing in action during the Vietnam War, developed the idea for a national flag to remind every American of the United U.S. service members whose fates were never accounted for during the war. The black and white image of a gaunt silhouette, a strand of barbed wire, and an ominous watchtower was designed by Newt Peasley, the former World War II pilot. Some claim the silhouette is a profile of Eastley's son, who had contracted hepatitis while training to go to Vietnam. The virus ravaged his body, leaving his features hollow and emaciated. They suggested that while uh, staring at his son's sunken features, Eastley saw the stark image of an American service member's 
held captive under harsh conditions. Using a pencil, he sketched his son's profile, creating the basis for a symbol that would come to have a powerful impact on the national conscience. By the end of the Vietnam War, more than 2,500 service members were listed by the Department of Defense as prisoners of war or missing in action. In 1979, as families of a missing pressed for a full accountability, Congress and the President proclaimed the first National POW MIA Recognition Day to acknowledge the family's concerns and symbolize the steadfast resolve of the American people to never forget the men and women who gave up their freedom protecting ours. Three years later, in 1982, the POW MIA flag became the only became the only flag other than the Stars and Stripes to fly over the White House in Washington, D.C. At this time, Rachel Harrington, veteran U.S. Air Force, will narrate the POW table ceremony. Army veteran Lee Buckley and, and uh, Chuck Lewis, veteran U.S. Navy and Air Force, will assist. The table that stands before you is a place of honor. In setting this table, we acknowledge those missing from our celebration today, and we remember them. The table is small and set for one, symbolizing the vulnerability of the lone prisoner against his captors. Remember. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing purity of the intention and in responding to our nation's call to arms. Remember. The chair is empty, for there is no one there. Remember. The wine glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us this night. Remember. The slices of lemon, reminding us of their bitter suffering. Remember. The grains of salt, representing the countless tears of the families. Remember. The single red rose reminding us of the loved ones who kept the faith awaiting their return. Remember. The burning candle and yellow ribbon symbolizing everlasting hope of a reunion with the missing. Remember. Remember all who served alongside them. We who have donned the same proud uniform, being sworn to the same faith and allegiance. We will never forget their sacrifice. Remember. Remember until the day they return home or find internal peace, we will remember. Almighty God, thank you. Almighty God, thank you for welcoming these courageous veterans into your kingdom. They valiantly fought to preserve the freedom we all enjoy today. We take consolation knowing that our loss is heaven's gain. Amen. Today, we're honored to have Gus Pagonis, Lieutenant General, retired veteran, United States Army, as our guest speaker. Gus grew up in Charleroi, and upon completion of his studies at Penn State, he received his commission as a second lieutenant through ROTC. From there, completing his officer basic and advanced courses, and also the U.S. Army Command General Staff College and Naval War College. During his military career, Gus held many command and staff positions. His most notable was commanding general for the 22nd Support Command in Saudi Arabia. As director of logistics during Desert Storm, he received high praise from General Norman Schwarzkopf for his tireless efforts and logistical prowess. As a young captain during the Tet Offensive of 1968, he and his command faced heavy, heavy enemy fire to rescue soldiers whose boat was stuck in the water. Decades later, he was awarded the Silver Star for his bravery. Gus retired from the military after nearly 30 years of service and began his second career. Gus and his wife Sherry have sons Gus and Robert. Gus and Sherry reside in the Evans City area. 
With great patriotic pride, I'm honored to present our speaker, Gus Pagonis. It's a real privilege and honor for me to participate in today's ceremony. When my wife, uh, she keeps record of this, I moved her 29 times in 30 years. And I try to get her a book to change it, but uh, she holds on to it and holds me captive. When we got out of the Army, we went to Sears, and I worked at the Sears headquarters for a few years, and we decided we were going to come back to western Pennsylvania. She's from Indiana, Pennsylvania, and I'm from Shawroy, and we decided to settle somewhere in the middle. Out of nowhere, in checking my parents' records, my mother was born in Butler. Why in the world she was born in Butler since she lived in El Equipa, I never have figured out. Either they were visiting friends and her, her, my, her mother decided to deliver, but we said, well, let's go to Butler area. So that's how we ended up coming back to the Butler area. Uh, when I graduated from Penn State, uh, I got commissioned in the morning, graduated, and got married all on the same day. And, we, and that's, it's very easy to keep my dates straight on anniversaries. It was also Flag Day. So I never forget our anniversary. We've been married 53 years, and I probably have only spent 20 of them with her because I was always deployed or somewhere working on the 14th of June. Both my sons joined the service. Uh, one became retired as a colonel. He now lives in the Butler area. And my other son, who my wife affectionately calls the real soldier, was an enlisted man who served in the 82nd Airborne, made over 150 jumps, and served three years, got out, used the GI Bill. Western Pennsylvania has a great heritage for the military and the representation of this award, this ceremony has been taking place for the last three days is indicative of that. But I gotta tell you a true story. A lot of people say, you know, generals, how do you stay from getting big headed or get egotistical? Well, when you're from Pennsylvania, you don't have to worry about it. Every war has certain things. The Vietnam War had a lot of music. The first Gulf War in 1990, every soldier, airman, sailor, and marine wanted to have their picture taken with a general officer. It was the fad of the time. General Schwarzkopf would visit me every week. And the first thing he would talk to me about was, are the troops eating? Are they getting showers? Then he would talk about the ammunition and all the other things you need to fight a war. That's the type of commander he was. And all the troops would line up to have their picture taken with General Schwarzkopf or have him autograph their helmet. Well, one day he came and there was like two, three hundred soldiers and Marines in line. And he would stay there, although his staff would keep telling him, you got to leave, you got to leave. He would stay there until he saw every soldier, shook every soldier's hand. And I, this one visit, there was about 300 people in his line, and I was standing oh, maybe 50 feet off to the left. And this young soldier walks up to me and says, General, can I get my picture taken with you? And I said, sure. He said, yeah, I'm from western Pennsylvania. I said, oh, I'm from Shaw. He says, yeah, I'm from Pittsburgh. I said, okay, let's have our picture. I said, but wouldn't you rather have your picture taken with General Schwarzkopf? And this young PFC, about 19 years old, looked me in the eye and said, yes, sir, but your line's a lot shorter. <laughs> now, that actually happened. And I, it's kind of hard to think the three-star general is that important when a young kid from Pittsburgh tells it to you like it is. You know, we're honoring men and women who maybe didn't have the parades and all the things that we now do for our young men and women. And by the way, soldiers are all 18, 19, and 20. It's only in the movies you see all these older people. That statistic he said about 33,000 of the names on this wall are 22 years or younger. They all served proudly and served their country without any regrets. A high school friend of mine from Manesson, Pennsylvania, Shaw and Manesson are sort of like twin cities, is on that wall. And I remember he, we had a meeting right before the Tet Offensive, which by the way, we won. The news media covered it differently. For those of you who remember, we lost 245 soldiers. The enemy lost tens of thousands. But the news media said, how could they ma have such a massive display of force? Well, they had thousands and thousands of people, but we actually won. But Pat Onderko called me and said, 
I said, what are you doing? You're, I thought you were leaving. He says, no, I can't leave. They don't, my replacement's not here. And he was killed on a convoy trying to get supplies out to the right troops. I have many other soldiers that have served with me that are on the wall. And I'm very pleased to know that this thing is now rotated and taken across the United States for those that can't get to Washington, D.C. I will tell you, that war was an interesting war. And it, they call it a conflict sometimes, but it was a war. I can't remember of very many battles we didn't win. When I was a young captain, I was in the Ming Kong Delta, and I can remember the rice fields and the farmers. When I first got there, couldn't do anything. By the time I left a year later, I was a commander for a year in combat. Uh, the rice fields, and they could take their crops to market, and it was very secure. My second tour was in Hawaii, and I was with the 101st Airborne Division. And there we had the same thing occur. I only mention that to you because for the younger people, we did have an obsession just like they have with their cell phones and texting. I was with my granddaughter. I had a ride on the bus and she was texting to a girl that was four seats in front of her. <laughs> and I, and I, so I'm, I understand the generation and what, how they communicate. But we had a problem in the Vietnam War. You could not turn on the TV when you didn't see the war in action. I remember my wife would not watch TV. She stayed here in Pennsylvania during both my tours in Vietnam. Uh, one with her mother and one by herself and uh, with our two sons and she would never turn on the TV. There was no censoring of it and you would actually see the battles going on as they were occurring and there was no notification given to people that were wounded or killed and a lot of times people saw it on TV. For those of you of my age bracket, you can remember that coverage. It was almost continuous for about 10 years. We also got to remember our young men and women who are now serving, and by the way, women make up a big, at least 15% of the armed forces now, and do a remarkable, remarkable job. In my command in the Gulf War, I had 80,000 troops. I ended up with about 100,000 at the end. Over 20% were female soldiers who, were, who did everything that their male counterpart did. And they served in combat, and they did remarkable jobs. But we sometimes forget again, that these young men and women are 18, 19, 20 years old. I would tell you that if any veteran needs a job and comes back to this area, you can't go wrong hiring them. They're drug free, they're disciplined, and they want to work. But I want to remember, I want to mention one statistic that we very seldom mention. There were 153,000 Purple Hearts given to soldiers who were wounded in combat. Another 40, 57,000 are on this wall, so over 230,000. Think about that. These were young men and women that suffered for life, loss of limb, stress, and all these kind of things that happened. There's no general alive that wants to have a war. My first six months in the Gulf War, we were hoping we were going to come home. We got up to 520,000 soldiers, and we finally said, okay, we're going to Kuwait. But the, when the war was over, we came home. The war ended in 100 hours. We thought the war would last at least a year. And it lasted only for 100 hours because of the remarkable performance of the men and women and a very outstanding commander in General Schwarzkopf that did not have a political hammer over his head, he was there to execute. I will never question the authority of those appointed over us or those we elect because they have more information than I have. I would just tell all of us, this war we're in now is a war. And the young men and women of the National Guard and Reserve and Active Force of the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps are serving this country with great distinction. And I would tell you all that have children, grandchildren, and friends, do not forget them. Again, this has been a great honor for me to be allowed to speak to you. I think it's wonderful for all the hard work these VFW and the ladies and men that have this certain type uniform on running around, you should thank them. This doesn't happen without their tremendous, tremendous hard work. They all have real jobs and they got to do this on the side. 
It's great to be back in western Pennsylvania. Uh, again, my wife uh, has a horse ranch here. Uh, that was part of the deal with the 29 moves in 30 years. Uh, it's not a very profitable thing, but she said no, she likes it. And she's at a horse show tonight, and she said, well, make sure you tell people I wanted to be there. I dragged her to a lot of social events in Washington, D.C., so she could tell me which fork to use. And, and, and if they didn't have signs on what you're going to eat, she would tell me, you know, you won't like that, you're like that. Uh, by the way, after 53 years, you can't even buy gifts anymore because there's nothing left to buy. So I already mentioned that in passing. But she said she would love to be here. This is a great event. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Gus, for being with us today, for your excellent remarks and your outstanding service to our country. At this time, we're going to remember the 43 young soldiers killed in action during Vietnam. Vietnam veteran and Purple Heart recipient Bob Johnson will now read the names of the 43 Butler County soldiers killed in action. He'll be assisted by Chuck Lewis. First of the 43 is Thomas Eugene Sezowitz. Number two is Douglas Vernon Andre. Number three is Charles Frederick Sitsan Fenda. Number four is Alan. George Lane. Number five, William Frederick Winters. Number six, Francis Claire Rummel. Number seven, Luciano Paul Plezikov. Number eight, James Thomas Steiner. Number nine, Harold Eugene Morrow. Number 10, Robert Charles Lennonberg. Number 11, Ronald Eugene Gerwig. Number 12, Raymond Patrick Link. Number 13, William Algy Lesnick. Number 14, Clyde Walter Klingensmith. Number 15, Joseph George Cusick. Number 16, Glenn Robert Wiley. Number 17, Thomas Russell Kisner. Number 18, Martin W. Wesleski. Number 19, Stephen William Ziegler. Number 20, John James McElroy. Number 21, Paul Stasco Jr. Number 22, Joseph Clarence Doyle. Number 23, Gary Dwayne Reed. Number 24, Walter Anthony Siskansky. Number 25, William Roger Campbell. Number 26, Charles William 
say number 27 Donald Ray Burnside number 28 Walter Edward Barnes number 29 Richard Dennis Coy number 30 Gary Richard George number 31 Edward Thomas Kiskowski number 32 Gerald Wayne Shackley number 33 Richard Harry Williams number 34 James Robert Koch number 35 Robert Lee Glasgow number 36 Paul Edward Anger number 37 James Albert Bailey number 38 Thomas Ralph Burline number 39 Kenneth Allen Barger number 40 David Hugh Smith number 41 Merle Dwayne Brown number 42 Edward Francis Heasley and the 43rd is Marlon McClendon Miller In a few minutes, we'll begin our candlelight service. We are honored to have with us this evening one of the Butler County's premier vocal groups, the Axe Choir. The Axe Choir. This diverse group of musicians comes from a wide range of ages, talents, and backgrounds. This evening, they will sing a medley of songs from all branches of the armed forces. As you arrive tonight or this evening, you may have uh, been presented with some glow sticks. If not, there will be some presented uh, to you. At this time, would you please proceed to the front of the wall. As you proceed, please enjoy the stirring medley of songs performed by the Axe Choir. <laughs> <laughs> 